Well, good morning. We welcome you on this day to come and worship our Heavenly Father. We also invite those and welcome those that are watching by, by screen as well. Just to let you know, um, our flowers today are dedicated to Heath and Susan Taylor. Um, there was just, uh, we had printed the bulletin before we were given the announcement, and so we just want to give them honor of that with the flowers. And I want to thank you as a congregation as well, too. Um, Shepherd's Heart, we were able to uh, give close to $2,000 of donations from you all uh, to help uh, with food distribution. So there was a number of us that were helping downtown uh, this Saturday um, as it was our, our service, and so we were able to give about 80 meals. So that's something. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, we do our fall festival uh, times, and uh, we weren't able to do that this year, but thank you for being gracious and to, uh, to give uh, for that. And that's a great opportunity to serve our community as well. So, um, The Lord has been our dwelling place in all generations. We're reminded of that today as we come before our Lord. And we're also reminded of faithfulness. We'll hear about that in our uh, parable reading from the gospel and also our uh, sermon. And so we'll be encouraged on what does it mean to serve. So, With that said, we begin with our opening hymn entitled, The Day is Surely Drawing Near. We stand to sing.
As God's name is placed on us, so we place again his name upon us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you have been our dwelling place to, in all generations before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Indeed, Christ is coming soon to raise the dead, to bring us into everlasting life with him. Yet there are times when we have lived as if Christ's return was not important and not imminent. Yet our Heavenly Father invites us to return to him and ask for his forgiveness. In silent reflection, we consider our sin and the need of forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have ignored you and our neighbors in need. We have sinned in our thoughts, our words, and actions. We have failed by our inactivity. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, O Lord, that we might be encouraged by your presence and forgiveness of our sins. God hears your confession and has promised to always be with you. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son, Jesus Christ, to die and rise for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We are forgiven. We look for the return of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. There are no children here this morning, but I would like to do a children's sermon with you, um, kind of as just a summary of what we'll hear throughout our worship today. You know, if I was to keep track of your life with a permanent magic marker, or I was to draw on your face as well too, you would know that it would instantly not disappear and it would be permanent. Um, if you were to use pencil, which children use, they're able to erase their mistakes, aren't they? And they're able to get rid of them. And sometimes um, when mistakes are made, people like to highlight, maybe not their mistakes, but the mistakes of others. You know, when we look at these simple things, it's really important for us to understand that when sin comes into our life, we sometimes think that it's something that is not forgiven. I speak about saints of God who sometimes find themselves, even though they are forgiven, ponder the sin of youth or things they've done in their life, and they feel that God has not forgiven them. I think that that's something that Satan can use easily within our life, especially when we're haunted by what we've done or said or treated by other people. And that's something that, that, that the devil can do to us. Other times we can highlight other people's sins. It's, it's nice to highlight other people's sins, what they've done wrong. But in all of that, you know, God is the one who erases sin. And that's the importance. I think we're reminded of Isaiah who says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. It's wonderful to come here each Sunday and to hear that God wipes away our sins and forgives us. And that's what we're here to do. Uh, so let us joyfully receive those words this morning. Today, again, we are continuing our reading of our scripture texts that speak about the end. And in the church year, we kind of look at those during this season before Advent. The first reading comes from Zephaniah, the Old Testament prophet. In today's Old Testament prophet reading, Zephani Zephaniah dr dramatically warns that the day of the Lord is near. Everything is ready for his coming. This reading sounds a striking warning also today to those who are complacent who live as if the day of judgment will never come, from Zephaniah 1. Be silent before the Lord God, 
For the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wall from the second quarter, a loud crashing of the hills, wailing, O inhabitants of Morden. For all the traders are no more, and all who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they built houses, and they shall not inhabit them, though the plant ye vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there, a day of wrath in that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blasts and battle cries against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians reading is again about the second coming of our Lord. It will be sudden without warning and final. So we are to be alert and self-controlled as we wait and watch. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying there is peace and security, and then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, they will not escape. But you are not of, in darkness, brothers and sisters, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are children of the light, children of the day. You are not of the light night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another, build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Let us rise and sing together our alleluias. <laughs> Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. We hear in our Gospel text, our Lord's parable of the tenants adds another facet to our watching and being ready for his return in glory. He wants us always to remember that as we wait and watch, we are watchful to use the gifts with which he blesses us to serve his purposes, not just our own. We are to invest ourselves according to the abilities he gives in the causes his, of his kingdom. There will be an accounting from Matthew 25. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one who he gave five talents, 
to another two, and to another one, and each according to his ability. Then he went away. For he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who has received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made you five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, he who also had two talents came toward, forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made you two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. For he who also received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you have scattered your seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for our sermon hymn of the day. Hark the voice of Jesus calling.
Would you join me in prayer, please? We pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you and we hear in our gospel text today, may we be as like those faithful servants who use their gifts for your glory. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Today we are in the end of the church year, and it's important, especially as we hear some of the scripture readings that are spoken to us this week, and then next week we uh, will continue the reading from Matthew 25. And so today we're looking at the second parable that appears in the gospel text for today, Matthew 25. And so you can read that next week as well, too, and it will tell you a little bit more about so today we're looking at a parable, sometimes entitled the parable of the talents. But I like to use a title a little bit different called the, the parable of the extravagant master. You may not be aware of this, but this parable is not so much about talents in, in the natural abilities, but more of a measurement of wealth. And a talent was about 7,000 denarii. And a denarii was considered one day's labor. And so if you think about that, take 7,000 days of labor, and how many years is that? That's probably 30 years. And then, so the master is quite generous and extravagantly generous as he gives to these men this money in order for them to invest it and use it so that he may gain from their investment. I think it's important for us to point this out to you because uh, is this a parable of stewardship? Is this about stewardship? And sadly, sometimes pastors will use this as a subtext for getting people to be involved more in church. And that's a good thing. Please understand that. But what I mean by that is that this parable can be used as a guilt trip. And pastors can do that. Parents can do that. People can do that. And so the question that we want to ask about is, what is the difference between the faithful and the unfaithful servant or the faithful servant? Well, the faithful servant is the one who takes the gifts and invests them and uses them for the glory of their master. He's the one who takes it, this generous gift given to him, and he then invests it. The unfaithful servant is the one who takes it and doesn't use it. And then, in his own foolishness, knowing who his master is, he experiences for him punishment and outcast. So how then are we wanting to be? We are wanting to be those faithful servants. I really want you to understand this, and I've highlighted it in the box in the handout. You see, the tragedy of this parable is not the failure to serve. I want to make that clear, okay? But it's really more about, it's a failure to trust, truly, excuse me, to truly know your Savior. What do I mean by that? You see, at times in the church, when we talk about earthly wealth, a lot of times when people talk about wealth, they hear the church speaking about money and they're turned off by it. How do people see church when they speak about money? Sometimes they think of it as offensive, terrible things. Other times, they think of the gospel of prosperity, and we know of preachers on television and places where they live in 10,000 square foot homes, and they have millions, in hundreds of millions of dollars, and they then preach a message that says, that if you work and pray and are faithful, then God will bless you with earthly possessions. And see, this parable, if read wrongly, will cause you to misunderstand what it's really about. The church only wants money, is that true? No. Does this turn people away from church? Possibly, but I'm not really sure what draws you to church. I would imagine I know what draws you to church. It's Jesus. The ministry of Jesus is all about not what we give to God, but what God gives to us. You notice in this parable how the generous master calls in his servants and gives to them each according to their ability. I mean, it's really a generous parable about what God gives to each of us. 
God has given to us many things, and not just money. Don't think of just money. He's given to us so many things in life for our care and our taking care of. I mean, that's really what Christian stewardship is. It's looking at your life and seeing that all God, that God has given to you. Don't attribute it to money only. Think of the people in which God has put within your life who you're called to serve. Think of the people and the places you work as well, too. These are only two, two realms in which we're talking about, but there is so much more that God has instilled and given to us, whether it's our natural ability, our spiritual gifts, even the gracious gifts of vocation. All of these, God has placed us in our life. To some, he's given great talent. I think I like that song that we sing there. Um, Hark the voice of Jesus crying. If you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say he died for all. You can lead the little children to the Savior's waiting arms. I mean, in all of this, this parable is not about the church, but it's about the kingdom of God. It's about where Christ dwells and what he's given to each of us and what he's given to the church to do. Think about what God has done for us. I mean, we think about the graciousness of a God who would give to us even when we are undeserving. I mean, Christ's death and resurrection and all of that, right? The ministry of Christ was one of healing and bringing salvation, but it was also giving forgiveness to a fallen world. That's what our Savior did and why he came. That's what he gives to us, doesn't he? He gives us the forgiveness of Christ, not to keep it, not to bury it, not to hide it, but to use it for his glory. Think about living your life and how you live your life. I mean, think of it this way. When we come to church on Sunday, imagine you have a bag that's given to you. And as you hear God's grace and forgiveness, that bag is filled up. And you take that bag then with you into your life, and you then freely are able to distribute it to others. One of the examples that I had, which was kind of an amazing story, was my father, which, who was a Lutheran principal, and the pastor of our church, were given, and this one went on for about seven years, they were given $50,000 for both of them to give away during the season of Christmas. I know that sounds kind of, kind of amazing, but the story behind the story was there was a man who was greatly poor. He was an engineer out of work, and through, through tinkering in his garage, he came up with an invention, a certain type of transistor switch that was then used by NASA with satellites. And the story went that as he was poor, he then invented this thing which produced a lot of wealth for him. And he wanted to give it away. And the example that I had seen was my father would take us to places and give, give away envelopes. And I asked him, why are you doing that? What, what, what's going on? And then he, he kind of explained the story that, that, that this man had instilled these gifts to, to people. And he wanted it done anonymous, so he trusted the Lutheran pastor and then the Lutheran principal. And so, so my father did that, and I observed that. But that became an important point, I think, for us as well too, right? God puts us in the realm of his kingdom. Wherever we are and wherever we're positioned, and he calls us to use the gifts that he's given to us. And so on Sunday morning, we come with a, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, and that bag we take out into the world. See, this parable isn't just about things in the future, but it's also about things today and how we live in the kingdom of God. Where God reigns within our life, how do we use the things that he has given to tell others of his love? Some do it with wealth, of course. But others do it with their time, their talents. Others do it through community outreach and many other things. There are ways in which people are using to spread and expand God's grace and give those gifts out to others in ways that we could never count it. But see, what is the difference with the servants? I mean, in this parable, returning back to the parable, what is the difference? The two graciously took the gifts which were given to them by the master and they invested them. The third unfaithful servant was fearful of what his master would do. And so he took that talent 
that extraordinary amount of wealth and buried it in the ground only to return it to his master. He failed to be faithful with what his master had given to him. And in turn, he was cast out. See, the master in this parable is Jesus. It's God. And what God gives to us is amazing, isn't it? See, God doesn't look at you and say, this is what you need to do. But it's to each according to his ability. Some people, going back to our hymn for a minute, some people will say, oh, I have nothing that I can give. The last para paragraph there says, let none hear you idly saying there's nothing I can do. While the multitudes are dying, the master calls for you. Take the task he gives you gladly. Let his work your pleasure be. Answer quickly while he call, calleth. Here am I, send me, send me. We don't have to be missionaries in the world. We don't have to even become professional church workers and pastors. We can be faithful Christians who see their calling in helping others and using their gifts in amazing ways. You see, this is kind of what I write in our outline. See, the parable calls us to live grace-filled lives, lives of forgiveness, lives of mercy, lives of kindness, and you could continue to add more and more to this list. How has God given you gifts? We sometimes talk about vocation. Vocation isn't a vacation, but a vocation is where God has placed you in your life and in your calling. Maybe it's a better way of describing this is, what is the sphere of your influence? So if you're a father like me, the influence in my sphere is my children, my wife. That's only on the, the level of family. There are other stations in life where I live, right? As a community member, how do I love my neighbors? As a citizen in our country, how do I live and love my neighbors, right? Um, each of these vocations has responsibilities and callings within the things we're to do. If you work at the post office, your calling and your vocation to be a Christian is to what? Be faithful in your service of delivering the mail. Do things in the best way that you can. Martin Luther, uh, or the reformer, once had a man come to him and say, Luther, I want to serve God. I make shoes. I want to quit my business and I want to become a monk. And Luther's response to this man was, no, don't do that. Instead, if you want to serve God in the best way possible, make the best shoe you can for the service of your neighbor and sell it at a fair price. You see, the vocation of what we do here in church and what we do outside of the church are all related it's all related in what God has given to you, where you're at, and how you use it to distribute his gifts of grace, of mercy, of love, of time, talents, and treasures, and even more than that. See, the parable isn't so much one that we're to be filled with fear and bury it, but we're to be gracious and see what the gracious master gives to us and invest it for others. Maybe you're familiar with Antonio Stradivarius. Antonio Stradivarius was a fine violin maker in the 1700s. So fine that even today they're considered priceless. Most people that play these violins don't own them. Believe it or not, there's a whole society of people that have invested and bought these violins. The violins are not, you're not able to purchase them, but what they are is they're given to the most talented of people. And so this society seeks those who are gifted to be able to play the instrument so that others may hear the music. The interesting thing is that in this society, when they give a violin to someone with great gifts, they're required to play publicly and freely for people to hear a couple times a year. Maybe that's a good image for us as well, too, that God gives us these things, and they're on loan to him, and we then are called to share them with others. That's what it means when we see the extravagant master who graciously gives us his gifts. The parable, as I said in the beginning, is not about failing to serve, but it's fail failing to truly know your Savior and what he gives for us. I'd like to maybe encourage you with these things. What has God given you to share with others? 
What people in your life need God's grace? Do we look for opportunity to grow in giving? Maybe those are things to challenge us as we take that bag with us into the world we live in. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, let us rise and confess our faith. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. But we're, today we're doing the Apostles' Creed, but we do the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed. Today we're looking at the first article. The first article of the Apostles' Creed and its meaning shows us that as Christians, we confess that I am God's creature and that He is our Heavenly Father who loves and cares for us. This enables Christians to say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures that he has given me my body and soul, eyes and ears and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing, shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger, guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. As we gather, we also pray for the people of God in Christ Jesus. Today, we want to pray for those that are, that are dealing with issues of health. We're, we're reminded of the fact that there are those in our congregation who deal with, with cancer and treatment. Um, to highlight a couple of those people, we pray for Colin Eschberger, for Pam Garwood, and for others as well, too, um, that are known to us. We also want to pray, too, for... For those that are mourning the loss of loved ones, as you know, uh, these holiday seasons can be difficult, especially as we, we cycle through and, and we, we, we feel the absence. We also want to pray, too, that, that we would find a vaccine that's able to help many people um, and that the Lord would give us leaders to make decisions that help. Let's pray. <clears throat> God of heaven, we come before you. As your faithful servants, Lord, give us opportunity to see all that you have entrusted to us in those gifts that give so greatly, your grace, your forgiveness. We pray, Lord, that we may live in your grace and give it to others as we live our lives. It's so easy in this nation of abundance to forget that the gifts you've given us are for really others. We pray, Lord, for our families, We pray for those that are far from you. We pray for our family and church members who are still at home, and we ask that you keep them safe and watch over them. We pray that our church ministry may reach out to others. We ask, Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for this great nation, the ability to freely worship you. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those Christians in places who are persecuted because of their faith that you would give them boldness in confessing your name, even in the midst of uncertainty. We ask this, that the church around the world may be faithful to your word, that we may be faithful to expand the kingdom of God. Lord, we pray also for those who lead us, that they may make the right decisions. We pray, Lord, for the president um, and the president to be coming into office. We ask that you would watch over every person that serves in every level of government. We pray for those that defend us, police and firefighters. Lord, we thank you also for those men and women who serve in our armed forces. We pray for the Kunkel family and for, we pray also for Pastor Nimsch and his family as he serves as a chaplain. We pray, Lord, also for Anthony Toops, who is going into the service, into the Navy. Uh, This weekend he starts. We pray that you'd be with him and give him a blessed career and service. 
We pray, Lord, for the Barrett family, for Al, Bob, and Kathy, for Colin, Gilbert, Francis, Pam, Richard, Alton, Anne, Reggie, Harry and Evelyn, Trish, Doris, Jean, Connie, Priscilla. Lord, we pray especially for Doris Randy. As she's in the hospital, we ask that you watch over her. We pray also, Lord, for Francis Frails as well, who was in the hospital but is home now. We ask that you watch over these women and give them strength. Be with their children that care for them. Be with all of these and your people. We pray in thanksgiving for the anniversary of the Taylors and also for the blessings of other anniversaries in our congregation. May we honor marriage among us all. We ask all this. Being bold to pray the prayer our Lord taught us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> At, you may be seated. We're going to sing our offertory as the offerings are brought forward today. rise. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our duty and our delight at all times and in all places to give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, now do we praise you that you did send to us your only begotten Son, and that in him being found in human form, you did manifest the fullness of your glory, through whom with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you for your great majesty. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And also after supper, he also took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is new covenant in my blood, shed for you also for the remission of sins. This do also in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The sin of the world, have mercy.
Please be seated. We sing verses 1 and 2 of Rock of Ages, Clef for Me, as we distribute to you. <laughs> receive the body of Christ. Take and eat the bread given for you for the forgiveness of sins. After receiving this bread, take and drink the true blood of Christ given for you for the forgiveness of sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in the true faith to life eternal. Depart in peace. Amen. We sing verses three and four of Rock of Ages, as we receive the utensils from communion. and sing together as we receive this gift with thanksgiving. The Lord has We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have graced us with your presence in this sacrament. <clears throat> and we pray that you would keep us in the one true faith until life everlasting when we enter into the joy of our master. Through the same Jesus Christ, 
your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our sending him, spread the reign of God the Lord. Please be seated. On behalf of our congregation, we welcome you all, especially as we uh, come to worship. But again, take your bag of grace and distribute it wherever you go. Um, do we have an announcement? Uh, the pecans and fruit cakes are being sold and they're out on the sidewalk. Okay. And that goes for what again? Lutheran Trail workers. Okay. So okay. So last year. Yeah. So we're selling those if you'd like to help. All that, all that money will go to help make uh, Bibles in Braille for people that can't see. Um, with that said, we want to invite you to stay for Bible class. We're looking at Ecclesiastes. We're going to start that book today, and we're looking forward to it. We've been studying the life of Solomon for the last two weeks, um, and so there's, a, there's some good stuff in his Ecclesiastes book. And then also, too, um, we're recording that Bible study, so if you want to listen to it, uh, we've been posting it on our website, so um, you can listen as we, we discuss it. So that's something new we're doing. Some people have asked about that. So uh, during the week, you can just uh, download it or, or, or listen to it. So. Uh, and also, too, um, we're doing confirmation on Tuesday. So we'll be, we'll be continuing that. So if there are no other announcements, once again, thank you for the support of uh, Shepherd's Heart. Uh, that's a great ministry that our church uses as people come to our door. They, they distribute tons and tons of food. So we're blessed. They've said this year... Um, has been an overflow of generosity even during these times. And so, so um, places like HEV and Walmart and other stores, they, they give a lot of their food away. So just understand that, um, that you support those businesses. They then return it to the community to give out. And our church, with many other churches in the community, uh, distribute each Saturday and on Tuesday and Thursday, I think, as well, too. So with that said, go and have a wonderful day. Uh, again, again, the front of the bulletin, Lord... You've been our dwelling place in all generations. 
If the sermon should inspire some thoughts from you, I wouldn't mind hearing that. So let us go.